My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Well, it is the fifth Sunday of Lent, and you'll notice immediately when you arrive at Mass that the crosses have been covered up. In many places, all those lovely statues of Our Lady and Saint Joseph and all the saints, they're all tightly wrapped in this purple drapery, impeding us from actually seeing those luminous faces and their eyes and even their tears. And the cross, well, the cross of Jesus that usually, I mean, often presides our chapels and our churches, well, even the very altar is covered in a, in a cloth. And, and uh, Jesus is covered in a cloth with ropes. It's as though it's about to be shipped back to Amazon for reimbursement. And, well, all those statues, those crucifixes, everything will stay that way until the very end of the celebration of the Lord's Passion on Good Friday. You can even keep them covered up until the just before the, the Easter Vigil. And indeed, families are encouraged to cover up their crucifixes or prominent holy uh, images in their own homes. These are practices that kind of extend or prolong the jarring impression you get from going to church and seeing all these statues uh, covered. And sometimes it's really nice, nice artwork that is covered. Now, it may seem a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but this veiling does kind of shake us up. It alerts us that we must tread softly now, that something special is going on. The veiling helps us now just to turn our attention to the very words of the Mass. Indeed, the very first indication that we get now is this hostility to Jesus. It's as though the Church wants us to do now the work ourselves, to picture the scenes ourselves. Let them come into our mind and to our heart without the actual statues kind of like getting in the way. And these veils heighten our anticipation of seeing Jesus truly, to not get used to his presence, not to allow us uh, to become kind of routine about going to Mass. Now some artists had to work on these images. They've often studied for many years and then perfected this art indeed during their whole lifetime. And indeed some priests had to raise the funds to buy these statues or these works of art. They had to get the agreement of the, of the parish council first. And after all that coordinating and all that special effort and all that beauty, well, now it's all covered. And it helps us to see, you know, sometimes we take all that work of art kind of like for granted. But when we see it covered, we think, okay, I have to pray here. And so this anticipation can particularly well be seen in today's gospel when we hear that some Greeks were there in Jerusalem, that they had traveled from Bethsaida, and they actually approached Philip, whose name suggests that, well, that he knew Greek, so that maybe he could be a good interpreter for them. The Hebrew around them, for these guys, it was like too much. They couldn't understand. Yeah, they could understand a little bit, uh, maybe a few words. But they were like tourists asking for directions. Eh? And so they took advantage to approach Philip there, knowing that he would help. And of course, they were asking for much more than simple directions. And they thought, well, Philip can really, he can clear this up. And yet they ask him this most marvelous of questions that had really nothing to do with the language itself, it has nothing to do with tourism. They said, Sir, we should like to see Jesus. Hmm? Sir, we want to see Jesus. In Latin, Domine volumus Jesum videre. We want to see Jesus. They want access. They just want to see him. They want to see his face, like his body, his person, which was somehow veiled to them up until now. And 
And what would you do if you were asked this question by men, perhaps by several men that approached you and said, we want to see Jesus? These men are not simply curious. They, they seem to be driven by a deeper and almost haunting desire. They want to see this man, Jesus. They, want, they don't want just photos or paintings to go by or descriptions. Everything they had heard about him, all, all those reports of miracles and of cures, all these things seemed to have made him larger than life. He had entered into Jerusalem like a king. He was surrounded by his entourage. He seemed, for them, he seemed inaccessible. But, you know, these are Greeks. They're accustomed to philosophy. Maybe they thought Jesus was like a, a sage that could give them some answers. You know, they could dialogue with him or something, you know. But just laying their eyes on this majestic figure, just doing that, would be huge. They had heard some of his doctrine. They had miracles described to them. They listened to some of his enthusiastic uh, reporters. The news of Jesus had indeed spread beyond the parochial confines of the, of the Hebrew world, the Jewish world. And it is said that this here, this moment, is like the first example of the non-Jewish culture coming in search of Christ. That his message, his life now pertains to them too, not just to the Jews. It seems more universal than some local prophecies or local re religion. And just before this, Jesus had been anointed with this very, very costly pint of pure nard by Mary of Bethany. And he had explained to them who objected to, you know, wasting all this uh, perfume and this, this ointment. He had he said uh, said this is not a waste of money because she is actually preparing me for my burial. He said, and I would suggest that maybe the fragrance was still lingering there in the air. But now, okay, they really want to see him. They just want to hear about him or even just smell him. They want to see him with their own eyes, like when we see a crucifix. When we see an image of our most sorrowful mother, we see an image, we see an icon, a representation, a sign of something, of course, much greater. Afterwards, in answer to them, the Lord would begin to now outline His upcoming passion, His death on the cross. So this is what Jesus says. Now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you most solemnly, unless a wheat grain falls on the ground and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it yields a rich harvest. So it's the Greeks that kind of like uh, provoked this answer from Jesus, this realization that the time was at hand. It is his hour, and he was now ready to glorify the Father's name. There's a tone of solemnity in your voice, Lord Jesus. The redemption is at hand. One senses a, a kind of a deep anticipation. And we are told in the Gospel that there was even a, like a clap of thunder right? and a voice from heaven reinforcing the seriousness of what he was saying. Some think that this, this roll of thunder might have been an angel speaking. They were saying, you know, what, what, did you guys hear that? Was that an angel? They were saying, it's, like a, it's kind of like a drum roll just before an important announcement. But this is what he says. And when I am lifted up from the cross, I shall draw all men to myself. And John says, by these words, he indicated the kind of death that he would die. He will draw all things to himself, or all people to his humanity, to his divinity, he draws you and me now to himself during this upcoming uh, Holy Week and these holy days so that we can really experience his redemptive presence, his all-encompassing love. I will draw you to myself, he's saying. And so these days are not just a traditional ritual that we're familiar with from year to year. I think those Greeks really felt his magnetism. He was drawing them closer they felt truly drawn and compelled by his love. You know, his divine love was now so irresistible. It was love that was so authentic, so total, so real. 
He was ready to desire, he was ready to, to sacrifice his own life for them and for you and for me. This is what must now imbue our minds, our hearts, right, with this coming, these coming holy days. Let us not lose the opportunity to experience the face of Jesus like these Greeks and experience the proud, profound depths of his love. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.